Hey everybody, Michael here once again. And as you might have noticed, I have been busy over the past few months crowdfunding money and sourcing used bikes to send to Ukraine with my nonprofit Bikes for Ukraine. But I thought I'd put together this little video and show you the story so far. So I'm here in Krakow, Poland on the first leg of what is probably gonna be a pretty insane trip. And if you've been wondering, you know, should I donate to Michael's Bikes for Ukraine.org campaign, crowdfunding, sending bikes uh, to Ukraine? I am gonna show you on the ground why you should. And I'll be wondering why you have it already. The last time I crossed the border into Ukraine was in 1992 and it was one of the wildest experiences traveling through this amazing country. I am so looking forward to meeting colleagues in Lviv, in Kiev, to see what we can do with Bikes for Ukraine. Thrilled to be here, looking forward to the last leg of the journey. It's not actually hard to get into the country unless you're Russian or Belarusian, of course, but the same visa rules apply as ever. So you just basically cross the border and you get your stamp. It is difficult to get there because there are only a few bus and train lines going in and out of the country. And I myself, I go through Poland. But I finally arrived in Lviv back on that first trip. I met the mayor to discuss the project with him and to get the city support for it. And I was even interviewed on television during an air raid in a bunker. Ukrainian style. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, we need crowdfunding. So I am in a refugee camp uh, just outside of Lviv. It's seven kilometers from the city center. This is one of three facilities in the city. It is a temporary landing place for newly arrived refugees. Um, this is a place where they can just take a deep breath after all of the horrors that they've seen in mostly eastern Ukraine and try and form a community and try and just you know, find themselves, right? So I think this facility was provided by the Polish government. So right here, there are 263 people. 100 of them are children, and it is a, a brand new facility, this one. So if you're watching the news and you're thinking, oh, okay, now they're just fighting in the East. That's where they're always fighting and everything is fine in the rest of Ukraine. You're wrong because there are still refugees arriving from the Donbass and from all of these other areas, and they need a facility like this. So what's the point? Is there a need? There are primary groups of users who really want bikes. First of all, it's the young people. The people who are like 13, 14, they're bored. They don't have anything to do. When I was 13 and 14, I had a bike gang and we just went riding around because it was something to do and we came home when we were hungry. That's what they need here. They need to have this kind of uh, you know, opportunity to just ride bikes around, get some exercise, bond in a social group instead of just lingering around here like they're doing. Mothers with children. Um, bikes that have, you know, back racks and carriers. Cargo bikes would be amazing in this neighborhood. You know, they could just do a community run to the supermarket and come back. So there are so many opportunities for bikes for Ukraine just right here in Lviv. The situation is still serious, even though it's not the headlines in the West anymore. This is real. It's still happening. People are still arriving in Western Ukraine and they need bikes. There are over 100 children in this camp. I've only seen two bikes. This is one of them, and the other one's a little bit bigger. So, man, they need ladies' bikes for mothers and kids. They need men's bikes. They need cargo bikes, and they need kids' bikes. So, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thirty years ago was the last time I walked out of this station into Kiev and it is amazing to be back. Slept on the train on these old Soviet trains, but what a ride and the air raid siren went off in the middle of the night and freaked me out. Um, normal for the people here, but not normal for me yet, uh, but it is amazing to be here and to be picked up with coffee by my man Vadim and we're going to do some crazy stuff here in Kiev to tell the story about bikes for Ukraine. We're on the road here on our way to Borodanka um, to see what we can do with bikes for Ukraine. But we're along this stretch of road for kilometers and kilometers on both sides of the road. There, there are simply trenches. This is where the Russians dug in with thousands and thousands of soldiers. There are military positions, there are foxholes, there are 
areas where the tanks would dig in, ready to move out. There are showers, there are tables. <laughs> it's really kind of a morbid curiosity to see all of these trenches. You just want to go exploring, you know, to see, you know, signs of life and these soldiers who are sent on these suicide missions uh, <laughs> towards Ukraine. Did not expect this fierce Ukrainian resistance. But the sign right there behind me is exactly why I'm not going to go walk into the woods and see, uh, you know, go exploring. Beware of mines. You don't know what's out there. The road, the entire way here is completely trashed by artillery, you know, bombing and shelling. The scale of the destruction is absolutely mind-blowing. Cleanup work has begun. It is underway, but so many buildings and especially homes have yet to be rebuilt. And also, winter is on its way. It is a massive undertaking as we would expect. And this impromptu monument with burned out cars from all over the region that were just placed here on a roadside, uh, most of them riddled with bullet holes, really is a moving experience. People were in those cars and they stand there as a testament to the absolute brutality of Russia. I have never seen anything like it. You can still smell the burned out buildings. You can really see how entire parts of the buildings were completely destroyed by uh, fighter jets dropping bombs, like old school, stupid military style. And yet along the main street, you just see people getting on with their lives. I was looking up the street just now at a group of people waiting for humanitarian aid, food coming in. Uh, they still need that. A lot, there were quite a lot of people on bikes, old, sturdy Ukrainian bikes, but there are a lot more people in all of these areas, let alone the rest of Ukraine in the east where they're being bombed right now, that have a real clear and present need for bikes. And we have the bikes in Denmark, in other parts of Europe, and this is why we need bikes for Ukraine. So I've spent half the day here in Chernihiv, uh, up near the Belarusian border and the middle of Chernihiv. The Russians never made it that far. It looks kind of like a normal Ukrainian city, but then I'm taken out here to the suburbs and really a five minute drive from the center of the city. And this is just an example of the absolute destruction um, in the early days of the war. This is just one home completely destroyed, but 45,000 homes were destroyed by Russian soldiers. Citizens in this neighborhood here were used as human shields. Tanks would park in their home while they're living there so the artillery from the Ukrainians couldn't uh, hit the homes and, and kill their own people. Brutal, brutal warfare. Really the point is that, you know, these places still exist. They are rebuilding. There's a guy I'm talking to who is spending all of his money on his three restaurants that he owns on rebuilding homes, delivering food to people who need it. Man, when you just stand here in this neighborhood outside of Chernihiv city center, and you see the absolute, you know, bombardment and destruction of just people's homes, you know? It just really hammers home how, you know, how many issues Ukraine has to deal with. And the other important thing is that these roads in neighborhoods like this are completely trashed by military vehicles, by shelling, and you name it. So combined with the shortage of gas in this country and the lack of vehicles, the lack of public transport, the difficult roads to navigate, man, this is where the bicycle rules supreme. Bikes can navigate this landscape, uh, get, you know, where they need to go, uh, around the puddles, around the potholes, man. The bicycle always there when you need it. So that is the need. It is dire and it is immediate and it's not going to change anytime soon at all. So after that first trip, it was time for a solution. Here in Denmark, this has always pissed me off. Here in Denmark, we scrap 400,000 bikes a year and we buy 500,000 new bikes every year. That means every decade, there's 1 million bikes lying around the streets. Most of them are scrapped by the insurance companies who just don't give a damn about bikes, but also people throwing out bikes out of their backyards in the big cities here in Denmark and the lost and found departments of all the national police districts. These are where the bikes get scrapped from. For all the beauty and simplicity of this project, I realized early on that, you know what? I think we started it about one month too late. Sympathy for the war in Ukraine had already started to fade away. People were looking towards their summer holidays and our crowdfunding was going pretty slow. Actually, still is to be honest. And it was a struggle also to get a hold of used bikes. Nevertheless, 
I persevered together with my team here in Copenhagen and we managed our first shipment. We had people donating private bikes here in Copenhagen and we put stickers that we had made on the bikes when they wrote their name on the sticker so that the Ukrainian on the receiving end had this kind of human to human connection. We also got a helping hand from another cool organization. So at the last minute, we needed bikes to get on this truck and be sent to Ukraine and Bicycle Kelly and Nils came on a truck on a Sunday with 30 bikes, man. That's so awesome. And they're going to go, as you know, to a good to a good home. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah, 16 years. 16 years. Yeah. Africa. Africa. Yeah. Ukraine is the same. Yeah. Same. Hel helping people uh, through uh, low cost mobility. There you go. And, they, and, they're, and we know, you know from Africa and I know from Ukraine that these will be uh, absolutely a lifeline yeah. for people who need yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, brother. That's it. Massive day here on Fredericksburg City Hall Square, man. We got all these bikes. The truck is filled with bikes and locks from ABUS and bikes donated by the Copenhagen Police and Bicycle Kelly and the people of Copenhagen and Fredericksburg. That truck is going straight to Lviv. I am going to be there to meet it. And we're going to give those bikes to people to meet them today. So it's been a long, hard journey in Copenhagen, trying to fundraise in a society that has kind of forgotten the war in Ukraine, trying to organize getting bikes on a truck to bring them here to Lviv and to other cities in Ukraine. But today is the day <laughs> the truck arrived. And look at this amazing space here in Lviv, 100 bikes from the Copenhagen police, from my friends at Bicycle Kelly who send bikes to Africa and have sent some here to us. Donations from the people of Copenhagen. We have all of these bikes ready to be put into service to give momentum to the people of Ukrainian cities. And it is amazing to finally be here, but we're not done because we are continuing the crowdfunding. This is just the first shipment of many, not only from Copenhagen, but from all over Europe. Secret dream, one million bikes for Ukraine. But let's start with this one. Thank you to everybody in Copenhagen, the volunteer team. Thank you to the volunteers here in Lviv. And thank you to the Ukrainian team as well. Let's get started. So uh, we just delivered the very first bikes of the first shipment of bikes for Ukraine at this refugee camp here in Lviv. All of these people come from really bombed out places, Donetsk and Kharkiv. And uh, we have just five bikes for them here, uh, some ladies' bikes and some men's bikes, all of them donated by people in Copenhagen. So Ola, Chiara, um, Peter, Lenny, and uh, a whole bunch of you. Um, your bikes are now here and we delivered it to the group of people and they just hopped on the bikes and they, they rode off. There's a park right here. So the first instinct was to just get on the bike and go ride it. Beautiful, perfect. We're gonna go to another refugee camp now and hand out more bikes uh, and make contact with the people. So um, there's one bike here. This one's still rotating around uh, the parking lot here. And I talked to one of the ladies and she said, uh, I, I'm going to use this to take my kids for bike rides, I'm going to use it to go shopping and they're going to share it with all the other families here in the refugee camp. I said, can you make sure you share the bikes and they're going, of course, we share everything, this is a community. So, first contact, bikes for Ukraine. So we're at the second camp and uh, this is the camp I visited the last time I was in Lviv and I met the kids. I can recognize some of them and they all came up and hugged me which is just like... Killing me, man. Okay. Just this close to breaking down. This is why we're here. The kids developed a system in about eight seconds flat for who's going to get the bike next. They lined up and they figured it out. The adults are just, just as thrilled. You're thinking the adults would be like, oh, cool bikes, you know, but they're all going, no, 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 we're going to use this for shopping. You know, we're going to totally divide it up and you can take a shopping trip, I can take a shopping trip. And just, you know, they're also grateful. 
So we finally set up all the bikes. We took photos with the people. I talked to them asking them how they're going to use the bikes, shopping, everyday life. Oh, and a few people said we're going to go for bike rides. But really, it's the practical use of the bicycle, the utility of the bicycle that is by far the most important for these people in these camps here. And that's just amazing because that is what the bicycle can do. Um, in normal city life, in times of war, in refugee camps, the bicycle is there to serve us when we need it. And we finally said, take the bikes, have a ride, and they just disappear. And that's the most beautiful thing is that <laughs> as soon as they're allowed to ride the bikes, they're gone. I don't know where the bikes are right now. They're coming back, they're going to take care of them as a community, but they just <laughs> disappeared. And they're out riding the bikes as they should. Cool. <laughs> What's the name of the dog? Oscar. Ah. It's like an old Yoda. <laughs> an old baby Yoda. <laughs> a whole bunch of the bikes on this first shipment will stay here in Lviv and they're going to set up, my colleagues here, uh, a bike share system for refugees. So you can just take a bike, use the bike and bring it back. It's called Rover Rent. And what we're doing today is packing this truck because I am going to a small village in the Kiev region, uh, Havralivka. Havralivka? Havralivka? Havralivka. <laughs> to deliver a few bikes there in this rural setting where they need bikes. And then I'm going to Chernihiv um, as well tomorrow on Wednesday to deliver a bunch of bikes to some NGOs who deliver um, uh, supplies and food to people in the bombed out area. So that's where this van is going, filled with 30 bikes. I'm going to make contact with people there because they need a lot of bikes and I'm going to talk about what kind of bikes they need and figure out how many they need and then I will be coming back again with even more bikes for Ukraine from Copenhagen to the good people of Ukrainian cities. Welcome to my new series, Urbanists in Cars Drinking Coffee and Delivering Bikes to Ukraine. But out here in the rural areas, there's no other way to get around. The buses aren't running, and so we borrowed a car here to get to, to different places to deliver bikes to the people. So yeah, I'm not the car guy. A little bit off brand for me to sit in the car and be driving it, but uh, this is the only way to get around. And this is also why they need bikes for Ukraine. First stop in the Kyiv region, we're delivering these bikes to this uh, small village, a rural area, and these amazing strong women are getting these bikes from uh, Copenhagen. These are social workers there, they work for the postal service, they, uh, they deliver food to people who can't uh, get into town. So these bikes are going to be used by these women, but they're going to be used in order to help other people in this rural area. And they need more bikes here. I just asked them, do you need more bikes? They go, oh my god, yeah, we have a huge rural area with lots of villages, um, five, eight kilometers between places, so they need more bikes here. But. You know, I said, you know, you, you guys ride in the rain like we do in Copenhagen. They're going, please, we ride in the snow. I mean, look at these incredibly strong Ukrainian women helping their fellow citizens doing so on bikes for Ukraine. Next stop today, we're in Chernihiv, which was really smashed by the Russians in Vain, and we're close to the Belarusian border here. And this is a social center, and again, there are staff here, volunteers who deliver food, uh, medicine supplies, everything that people in the really bombed out suburban areas need, because there's no public transport, the roads are trashed, and people need all of these things. So we are donating these bikes for Ukraine to this social center here, and they will put every single bike to good use. So another NGO who have a volunteer group who deliver food and supplies to people in, again, the bombed out neighborhoods in this city, which was absolutely trashed by the Russians and occupied. And they have 50 volunteers, so we had five bikes left over, and they asked us, hey, can we just take the five bikes? I said, yeah, man, of course. And they need 50, so I guess I have to come back and bring more bikes for Ukraine. And we need your donations to make this happen, to continue the work. I'm back in Lviv and I've delivered bikes to six different drop-off points in three cities here in Ukraine and uh, it has been an amazing trip to see the resilience of the Ukrainian people and how grateful they are for these used bikes that we just throw out in Denmark and other parts of Europe um, and most of the bikes basically all of the bikes I've delivered to people are in use as we speak the next day they were out using them in the Bucha region in the city of Chernihiv to deliver uh, food and medicine to people in the bombed out outlying areas. Now, the original goal was 
2,000 bikes. We've delivered the first hundred, so this is really just the beginning of the journey. But since I've been here, word is spreading in the country about bikes for Ukraine. Just yesterday, I received an appeal from the city of Mykolaiv, which was brutally bombed yesterday with missiles um, sent in from the Black Sea, Russian warships and submarines. Um, absolutely brutal scenes that we've seen on the news. Uh, the city of Dnipro also, the city of Chernihiv needs more bikes. I mean, I don't know where this ends basically, but we need more bikes for Ukraine. And when I get back to Denmark, I will start working hard on sourcing bikes, but I also need you to help in sourcing financial donations to Bikes for Ukraine on our GoFundMe. Just the beginning, there are bikes in Denmark, there are bikes other places in Europe, and this country needs them. There's also, I've learned, a shortage of bikes all over the world because of the COVID pandemic and the shipping supply lines are, are behind schedule uh, up to like a year in some cases. So the bikes that they want here, they can't even get them because uh, of this general problem with shipping. So even more important um, to get bikes here to the people of Ukraine, to the cities where they need them and they need them now. So let's continue the hard work. Thank you to the amazing volunteers in Copenhagen, the amazing volunteers here in Ukraine who bend over backwards whenever we need their help. This is the beginning, more bikes for Ukraine. So as you can see, I am still working on this project and probably will be for a very long time. I'm in the process of sourcing used bikes all over Europe. But the question is, how can you get involved? There are three ways for you to get involved, basically. Crowdfunding. We need money to make this happen. Simple as that. If you're in Europe, in a city where there is a surplus of bikes, generally in Northern Europe, but wherever you are, you can do a bike collection. You get together 200 bikes and I will send a truck and I will get those bikes to Ukraine. And also, wherever you are, you can do a bike sponsorship. You can fundraise yourself locally using our material. Uh, we'll hook you up with all of the stuff that we've done uh, and the logo and everything. And if you raise 5,000 euros, about 5,000 US dollars, you can sponsor a bike shipment and we'll get stickers on the bike saying a gift from whoever you are and your organization or your group of friends. And you can follow the whole journey because I will take them to Ukraine and I will show you exactly where the bikes are going to be used and by whom they'll be used. So there are different ways you can help us out. This is a long journey and the Ukrainians, as we've shown you here in this film, still need lots and lots of bikes. So get involved today however you can. Catch you next time.